Well, as you're finding your seats, uh, you can find your Bible as well. We'll be in Acts chapter 27 this morning. You can also uh, fire up that app, and it's got everything that you'll need for this morning. Hopefully, that's a help to you. We, uh, we, we want you to be able to have more explanation about our announcements and, uh, and, and more um, opportunities to uh, write things down in the service. So if you hit that save feature on that app, it'll allow you to go back to that. So we just finished our series last month uh, on our road trip to joy. And so we've got, we have a week here in between. Uh, next Sunday, we'll do uh, a, a standalone message about Thanksgiving, so gratefulness. We'll look at the practical aspects of what it is to be grateful. And then we'll start really what's a traditional Advent series that I'm looking forward to. So that meant that we had a week in between, and, and we've been looking for a week in between all these series where I could revisit the content that, uh, that I shared about a month ago on our Night of Vision. And so if you were at our Night of Vision, you're going to get to hear that again. Uh, I'm going to share it a little bit differently on a Sunday morning than, than I did then, but uh, it gives us an opportunity to, as a church, all be on the same page. So this morning's gonna be a different message uh, that I would normally share. It's gonna be uh, kind of a 30,000 foot view of some things as a church. It's also gonna be very practical. I'm gonna update you on, on where we are with our budget and how we're giving. And uh, I wanna show, tell you a story from the Bible, some of my favorite stories that I think's got one of the uh, most challenging and timeless principles uh, and examples of obedience in all the scripture, especially the New Testament, and then at the end, I'm just going to call us to see uh, what it is that God would have us to do with this. So thanks for being here, and I hope uh, this will help us all be on the same page about where we are as a church. Uh, I shared this in our Night of Vision, and I used this example. The, the late uh, theologian Eugene Peterson, who's the author of the, the Message Bible, if you ever use the Message Bible, it's a kind of a modern, practical, uh, not necessarily a translation, but uh, but it's a... It's a, I forget the word, but he, he, he gives the, the, uh, the, a very modern interpretation of the scriptures in the message, very practical. And so he, he wrote a lot about discipleship in his other writings. And one of his other writings was called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And that's the way he described discipleship. He, he wrote the commentary uh, on the, on the uh, Psalms of Ascent. And that book was called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And he talked about spiritual growth uh, being a long obedience rather than an instant act. And I think in our lives at times, we wish it were the other way. We wish things happened quicker in our lives, but, but growing in spiritual maturity, it really is a long obedience in the same direction. And so not unlike spiritual growth, church growth follows a similar, similar pattern. And their, uh, their church growth happens with longevity of a group of people following and trusting God with a long obedience in the same direction. And so I find our, us as a church kind of in a similar place, this concept of, of not what can we, what can we do uh, immediately or, or what, what is a big event or something we can do to capture the attention of the community fast, but what can we do to be obedient for the long haul? Who can we be as a church to have a long obedience in the same direction? So you think about the church, we're connected to each other by our salvation and we are committed to each other and to the community with this long obedience in the same direction. So here's what I want us to see today is this, this principle that we're holding tightly onto that we really believe. And it's that life is better in community. It really is. Life, life is so much better in community. As followers of Jesus, we are not meant for isolation. As humans, we were never created to, to live in isolation. Life is better in community and we are better together as a church, which means it's so important that we are on the same page, moving in the same direction. And so by way of recap, just remember, our mission as a church is to be a church who finds life in Jesus, loves our neighbors, and helps others do the same. That's the mission of Community Bible Church, to, find, to be a church that finds life in Jesus, loves our neighbors, and helps others to do the same. And we say that our vision is to see Jesus transform every person and every, every place in the River Valley and beyond, not just our campus, but our other campuses all over. And so we put that into a strategy of four things that we do. We gather, which is worship. We connect, which is relationships and groups. And we serve. We serve each other. We serve the community. And we share. We share the gospel of gratitude and expectancy. So the way that we live out our mission, the way that we live out our vision is through gathering, connecting, serving, and sharing. That's who we are. So why does all that matter? Well, it matters because life truly is better in community. And it matters because there's no better way to live, I don't believe, in the way that the scripture tells us to live is that there's no better way to live than 
within a body of Christ with a group of people who share the same faith, who share the same beliefs, who are moving in the same direction to try to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't think there's anything greater than sharing our life together and following Jesus together to try to make a big deal about the gospel in our community. That's who we are. We're not just called to be people that pop in on Sundays when it's convenient and then, and then to leave. We are called to be together, to live together in community and collectively with our gifts and collectively with who God's made us to be to go reach our community. Here's some real practical highlights. I'm gonna give you some real practical highlights from the year, kind of show you where we are. Then I'm gonna tell you a story. And then I'm gonna tell you what I believe our, our next big vision is for the church. So in 2021, which we're coming to the end of, this church gave generously with, with setbacks and even through crisis. Uh, when the back half of our building earlier this year flooded, we, we believed that that was an opportunity for us to not just fix the things that were flooded, but to renovate our entire community kid space and to create a new community room. All that project is complete except for a few uh, things that are gonna hang up on the wall upstairs to help with sound. And so that project is completed. So last year as a church, you gave above what we spent. We gave above what we spent. You gave generously, which was in the area of three hundred sixty to three hundred seventy thousand dollars. And then above that, outside of our budget, this church, you gave sixty thousand dollars so that we could do that renovation. And so all of those things were done. So last year you were very generous. And you keep in mind that as a church, we are debt free on this building, our other building, and all of our properties. And so you were very, very generous. Last year, our budget year starts October 1st, which was last month. And we as a church are already on track to give far above what our budget is. And then last week, uh, our trustees approved uh, $20,000 that we're going to spend here on our, on our campus to update our outside signage, which we've been working towards for a long, long time. So the next probably two months, we hope that project is done, which on the front of our building, it'll say Community Bible in Greenwood, let people see it. You'll be able to see it from the road. It'll be lit at night and it'll, it'll tell people who we are. And so I say all that to say that, that we're, we're kind of at a point in a church where we are growing in a number of ways. We're growing in our generosity. We're growing numerically in certain areas, but we're also coming to a place of maturity as a church that we haven't been to, um, been at in a long time. And so that, that means that we're at a critical place because now we've got to make some decisions. We need to continue to be generous. We need to continue to give and to serve and to reach our community. And I believe that God has given us a wonderful opportunity to reach our community with the gospel. And I believe that as a church, our next step of faith is to invest greatly in our next generation. It's to invest in the next generation of children and students that are coming through this community and this church. That's who's moving here. That's who's moving to Greenwood, our young families. My son was working on a, a, cl a class he's working on and he was dissecting a speech for a, a composition class he's taken. And so we were kind of going back and forth about uh, Jim Valvano, Valvano's old speech, if you remember that speech when he gave it at the ESPYs many years ago. And as we were kind of working through that and talking through some of the highlights of it, one thing that stood out to me in that speech is that when he's asking for money for cancer research, and this is kind of the beginnings of when cancer research really started to come on the forefront, he said, it's not, it's not gonna save my life but it might save the life of my children. It might save the life of my grandchildren. Uh, and, it was, and it was a very, very interesting way to, to put into perspective what he was trying to do. And I think when we think as a church, that what, what God has called us to do, our vision to reach this next generation, it might not be for my children. It might not be for your children or your grandchildren, but it might be for my grandchildren. It might be for your great-grandchildren. But I do believe that God's called us to take some greater steps of faith in reaching the next generation of our church and our community. So I wanna share with you a story out of Acts 27. And then at the end of that story, I'm gonna kind of tell you where we are. Ask you to pray with me and, and see if we're ready to push out into some deep waters. So what happens at the end of Acts 26 is Paul is, is sentenced to go before Caesar. He's gotta to go to Rome and defend the faith, basically. He's been accused, arrested of all kind of varied things. And so he's gonna to have to eventually get to Rome to stand before Caesar but there's some steps before that. And so he's in Caesarea. He's already testif testified before the governors, which were Felix and Festus, if you remember this story in Acts 26. In fact, if you're looking for a great template for how to share your faith, then spend a little time in Acts 26 because Paul gives a great testimony of here's who I was before Christ. Here's what happened to me on the Damascus Road when I found salvation. And now here's my life since. 
And so that gives us a great template of how to share. So this is what Paul's doing. So we get to the end of Acts 26, and now he's testifying before the Jewish king, which is Agrippa at the time. And he, he gives this story of conversion to King Agrippa. And at the end of that chapter, Agrippa says this, Paul, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. Paul, you almost persuaded me, your story, your testimony, your life change, you almost persuaded me to change my mind about Jesus. But still, he has to start his journey to Rome. So that's what happens in Acts 27. As Paul begins this journey to Rome, and the, the goal is to get before the emperor, which is Caesar, to be tried. So what happens over the next 44 verses in Acts 27 is a very detailed account of this rough journey that Paul and the others on this ship go through. It's, it's, it's very detailed. There's a lot of things that are happening. And for most of the people in this story, this was likely one of the worst experiences that they'd ever had in their life, especially while traveling at sea, which many of them were accustomed to. So in ver the first eight verses, we're alerted to this is a voyage and it's gonna prove to be difficult. We get those warnings early on in the story that they're sailing in a time where they normally wouldn't sail. It's the winter season. Normally that, that would not be a time where you'd set out, especially on a journey like this, but because of trying to get Paul to Caesar, they decided to go. And so early on, we're told that this is gonna be a difficult, difficult journey. Listen to verses seven and eight. It says, we sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Nidus. And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete off of Salmone. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lasea. So with time passing and the storms not getting any better, Paul advises those in charge that things are gonna get worse. Now, this isn't a, a prophetic announcement from Paul. He's just simply saying, look, I've been on these types of journeys before and I've been during this, this winter season before and what's happening now is not gonna get any better and it's gonna get worse. And what we are setting ourselves up for is a very, very difficult journey. In fact, he's predicting that along the way, not only are we gonna lose cargo and not only are we gonna lose probably this entire ship, well, we're probably also gonna have a lot of loss of life. That was a real possibility. But those in charge were not interested in what Paul had to say. They were pressing on because their orders were, you gotta get this man Paul to Caesar, which would prove to be a costly decision. So the storms continue to rage in this story. The captain begins to adjust their route. They begin to sail very, very close to the shoreline, which would provide them some cover and some relief from the punishing winds and rains of this storm. But as the storm continues to grow, the sailors are now faced with what's likely or possibly a life-altering scenario. So pick it back up in verse 14. Listen to what happens. It says, but soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting, hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear and thus were driven along. And since we were violently storm tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. And so they're not in a good situation. When these sailors, many who were experienced, were starting to throw things overboard, you know that this is a dire situation. You know that it is a very serious situation. Things aren't good and most of them now are at fear in their lives. And you know that they've gotta be scared that they're gonna live because if they start throwing tackle overboard, you know how that is, Mr. Gerald. There's no way you'd ever start throwing your tackle overboard. That's, that's where the money is, right? So you know that this is a serious, serious situation. And so Paul has tried to offer his advice. He's tried to advise them. He's tried to let those know in charge that, hey, we are likely headed for trouble, but they're not listening. So now what they're doing is they're staying as close as they can to the shore, hoping that the the, the shoreline and the trees and the, the changes in elevation would protect them from the wind. They're throwing things overboard. They're trying to lighten their load. And now at this point, they have no control and they're simply at the mercy of this storm. And so in these days, uh, sailors, and if you, if you go back to the verse 20 where it said, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, 
during this time, that's, a, that's, a, that's the way they would navigate, was by the stars and, and by the sun, and they would, they, that would help them know which way to go. So when this, this passage tells us that, that for three days they hadn't seen sun nor stars, this is alerting to us that, that they have no idea where they are, they have no idea where they're going, and at this point, they've not been able to navigate their route for many, many days. So they're lost, they're tossed, and they're headed for a certain shipwreck. And this is the point where they begin to really, really lose hope. And so at this point in the story, it's been about two weeks uh, have passed. It's been a long, long storm. Uh, This is not a one-nighter. This has been a long storm. And so it's been about two weeks since they started tossing stuff overboard, which likely was some of their food and their rations. So they're hungry and they're tired and they're scared and they're ready to quit. And so Paul gathers on all those on the ship. And this is in the verse 21. Listen to what he says. He says, men... You should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart. Listen to this. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. So Paul gives a different message. Now, this is not Paul's prediction of what's going to happen. This is a word from God. So Paul calls them together and says, listen, I have heard from God. And he says, God has told me two two things, two promises. One is that there will be no loss of life. God has ordained it for me to get to Caesar, which means that he's going to save every single person on this ship. And so there will be no loss of life. And the second promise is this, is that God can be trusted. And so what happens next is a series of events that will eventually lead to this ship's destruction. They will run aground. They'll lose everything. But as Paul had promised, everybody survives. The passage later tells us that all 276 passengers make it safely to the beach where they landed. But something amazing happens in this story. And this next thing that happens in these next couple of verses has been, has been a really important promise in my life. And for different times in my life, different seasons in my life, it's been, it's been a very difficult uh, spiritual practice for me to practice, but God has used this passage in my life. And I think for where we are as a church, these, these next two verses are, are where we are and what God is asking of us. Listen to verse 30 and 32, which I believe is one of the greatest acts of faith and trust you will ever see. In verse 30, it says, And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea, under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. And listen to verse 32. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. I want you to listen to this in the New Living Translation. Same, same three verses in a different translation. It says, then the sailors tried to abandon the ship. They lowered the lifeboat as though they were going to put out anchors from the front of the ship. But Paul said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, you will all die unless the sailors stay aboard. So the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboat and let it drift away. This is the last decision they had to make. They had done everything that they possibly could do at this point of, of tying up the rudders and tying, tying this and tying that and trying to save the boat and lightening the load. But the one thing that they did not have to want to do is to cut away the lifeboat which was the only way that they had a chance. Unless something supernatural happens in this story by cutting away the lifeboat, it was sure that they would drown. It would be sure that unless they, this boat capsized close enough where they could get to the beach, cutting away the lifeboat was this last and final, and I believe greatest acts of faith. Because here's what this means, to finally cut away the lifeboats on this big ship, to finally cut away their last hope of survival meant this. Is one, it means they had, a, they had no backup plan now. And two, that they were willing to cut away anything of value that kept them from full dependence on God. So here's what happens. God gives them a prophetic word. Not one single person is going to lose their life. And now it comes to whether or not are we going to trust what God said. By way of Paul, are we going to trust the Lord? He said he will keep us. He said he'll protect us. He said there'll be no loss of life. So are we willing, do we have the faith to cut away this lifeboat where we know that God, unless God intervenes, we're going to lose our lives. And so once the lifeboats have been cut away, they knew that a shipwreck was bound to happen. And so Paul reminds them again of God's promise. And then he did this. Listen to this in verse 35. This is something that only, 
someone with just unbelievable faith could ever imagine doing. Listen to 35. It says, and when he had said these things, he took bread. This is talking about Paul. And when he had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. And we were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Paul was so confident in God's plan in the middle of this storm, in the middle of, of them about to shipwreck, as they have just cut away the life, which their last chance, Paul says, why don't we stop and have communion, right? You can imagine everybody's panicked. Everybody's trying to decide, is this guy outside of his mind? Do we trust him as the God he serves, the one true God? Do we believe him? Is God really gonna step in and save us? And so Paul is so confident and so trusting in the promises and the word of God, he says, why don't we just take time through communion to thank God? Can you imagine this boat just, just tossing and, and they're, they're heading for rocks and all this and Paul is leading them in communion. It's an evidence of the faith and the trust he had. And when they finished communion, they threw what was left on the boat into the ocean. And at this point in their journey, they had thrown everything over that the ship had. There's nothing left, no more supplies, no more safety equipment, and no lifeboat. And all that remained to rescue them was a promise of God by way of Paul. Here's the end of the story. Verse 39. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors, left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that had tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow struck, remained immovable, and the stem was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land. Listen to this. And the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. This is an unbelievable story of the promises of God and people having to make a decision, how much do we really trust God? How much do we really trust him? Because if we cut away these, these lifeboats, these things that provide us security, then it really is gonna to have to be God or nothing. God really is gonna either have to come through for us in a supernatural way or we're not gonna know what to do. And it might cost us our lives. And church, in a, in, a, in a very practical way, I think this is the point we find ourselves in as a church. We are 12 years old as a church last month and we've been on this campus for 10 years. And we've had some smooth sailing, but we've also navigated some difficult waters. And I think the time now as a church is for us to decide, who it is we want to be? Do we really believe in our mission? Do we really believe in our vision? Do we really want to do all that we can do to get the gospel to Greenwood, to get the gospel to the River Valley, to grow here on our campus in spiritual maturity and make a huge impact in the lives of our kids and students? And I think it's time for us to decide who do we want to be as a, as a church for our community? Do we want to be a church that plays it safe, that stays in smooth seas and, and decides that mediocrity is okay? Or are we willing to shove out to sea to cut away all the lifeboats and just trust God? Anything that weighs us down, anything that gives us part, things of comfort that would keep us from trusting God, are we willing to cut away all those things and to set sail as a church into deep waters knowing that God's gotta come through for us? Because I think that's where we are as a church. I think it's time as a church, we recognize some of these lifeboats that we have, things that we hold on to, attitudes that we may have, cut those things away and set out onto deep waters and see what God might do. See if God would lead us to some things. Here's a few things that I think can be lifeboats for us that I think are worth considering. One lifeboat I think for us is any thoughts, attitudes, or actions of letting other people carry the load here instead of doing our part. You see, in a, in a church, a small church like ours, a small group of people often carry the load. That, that happens in a lot of churches, to be honest with you. A lot of times in churches, even good churches, 20 to 25% of the, of the people are doing most of the work. They're doing most of the serving, most of the attending, and the majority of the giving. And in some ways, that's been true in our church at different times. And so one of the things I think is a lifeboat for us or something that, that kind of can be a crutch or something we hold on to is, well, I don't have to 
to do this. I don't have to give or I don't have to serve because there's other people around me that are doing those things. Well, that's a lifeblood of a church that's really gonna set out in deep waters and trust God. means we have to get rid of any attitudes or actions that other, other people are gonna do what I'm supposed to do. Other people are gonna pick up the slack from the areas of my life that I'm being disobedient. Because in a, in a church, although it's an organization, it's the body of Christ, every single person is necessary and needed and valued in the organization for it to be all that God wants it to be. And so maybe one of the lifeboats that, that you or me or our church needs to cut away is this, this attitude of other people are gonna pick up the things that I'm not willing to do. Here's another one. Another lifeboat for us can be that our lack of urgency to give and to serve because we've always been supported by our Fort Smith campus. Now this one is, is a little more specific you know, along the way in our, in our years as a church, there have been many, many years that without the support of our Fort Smith campus, who was our sending campus, uh, it would have been difficult for us to, to keep the doors open, to keep the lights on. But that's not true anymore. Uh, we have grown in maturity as a church and as a people, and we've grown in spiritual maturity. And I think at times in the past, it's been an attitude of, well, if I don't give or if I don't serve or if I don't, you know, do my part in the church, it's okay because we have another campus, our Sydney campus. They'll, they'll take care of us financially. They'll even send us volunteers as they have in the past. And while we deeply value being a part of this group of churches that's Community Bible and reaching as best we can the greater River Valley, we need to take greater responsibility to to being a spiritually mature, a financially mature church, not, not just so that we're mature, but so that we can be a sending church, so that we can go plant a church somewhere down the road that needs a church like Community Bible. And I think at times, one of these lifeboats that needs to be cut away is this attitude of, well, we have somebody that's gonna step in for us when we lack urgency. And then here's the last one that I'll mention. One of these lifeboats, I think at times can be just our attitudes of apathy and mediocrity about our campus in our property. One of the things I, I love about this church is its simplicity. I like these buildings because I believe it's a place that people can come and feel comfortable. I believe it's a place that somebody that's outside of church or had a bad experience with church could come in and not be overwhelmed. But I also want to remind us that one of the values of our church is first and best, which means we have a value of excellence, which means it matters to, it should matter to us because it matters to God how we present ourselves as a church. We need to do our best with our facilities. We need to do our best with the monies that, that we give to make sure that we're, we're providing a place of excellence, a place that uh, is, has as very few hindrances as possible for our kids, for our students, and for our worship. And our buildings and our property and our overall appearance, it needs to improve quickly. And at times, I think if we carry an attitude of, oh, it's, just, it's okay, it's just an old, old lumber yard, well, that, that attitude at times can keep us from, from putting excellence on who we are as a church. And when people drive by this place, they, they need to know that it matters to us because the gospel matters to us. And so there's many more lifeboats or things in our lives that we could hold on to. But I wanna remind you of verse 25 again. Paul says, so take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. And church, here's what I believe. I believe as a church, we are a few wise choices from expanding our reach, from exploding in growth and being a church of greater influence in Greenwood. I believe that with my whole heart. I've told that to people privately. I've told it in other meetings and other groups. And I believe it. I believe that as Community Bible in Greenwood, we are a few wise choices away from exploding in growth, expanding our reach and having a greater impact and greater influence in Greenwood. Now, I don't know what all those choices are, but I'm trusting the Lord. I'm willing to set out in deep waters. I'm willing to set us out as a church into some things that make us uncomfortable because I believe that much in who God is. I believe that much that God wants to do these things in us and in our community. And more than ever before, I believe Greenwood in this area needs Community Bible Church. I believe our community needs a church like this that will get the gospel to them. So I, I think it's time for us to set sail into some deep waters because our next generation of children and students, and again, it might not be mine and it might not be yours, but it will be those that are coming along that we have a place where we're willing to do whatever it takes to reach them and their friends and their families. So here's my challenge for us. And then I'm gonna give you some real practical things and we'll close. 
My challenge for us is to dive deep into our hearts, let the Holy Spirit begin to do some work. What are the lifeboats in our lives, personally and corporately, that we need to cut away to trust God and believe? And let's commit to really showing and demonstrating to this community that life really is better in community. Life is better when we live it together. Life is better when we're all in for our church because the gospel matters to us. If we've been radically changed by the gospel and we're experiencing life together in community, then let's live that way. So a couple of practical steps. One, our first step is to pray. We need to begin praying and continuing to pray together for our future. We've established a prayer team and this, this team is going to undergird all that we do with prayer. I, I'm gonna keep them updated on, on prayer needs that come to me from the church and from our people, but the things that we begin to step out and to set sail on these deep waters, this team is gonna make sure that we're bathing and covering everything we do in prayer. And if, if, if that's something that you want to be a part of at both worship stations and out here at our Connect booth, there's a place where you can sign up to be a part of our prayer team. We're, we're trying to get that team established and put together so that they can begin meeting together, praying together, sharing together, and making sure that we're praying about what future projects to invest in and praying that God would provide and give us more ways to be good stewards and to reach our community. It's our first step to pray. Here's our next step. It's just to get really honest about What's next for us? So I wanna give you a list of things. So we've, we've finished renovating all of this building up to right outside these doors and you can see where the paint stops. Our next step inside is about a $10,000 paint job that'll paint the rest of this lobby. That's what we need to do next. That's money that's outside of our budget. It's money that we're gonna have to give or raise to do that. So that's the next inside thing. And then after that is we need to spend about seven to $10,000 on cameras. We've got outside cameras that are helping us be more safe, our team that keeps us safe on Sundays and when we have events. Uh, I need to get that team camera so that they can make sure that they're seeing everything, especially in our kids' areas, so that we're doing all that we can do to keep our kids and our families and our buildings safe on Sundays. So those are the next two things practically that we need to do. Outside, here's where the future is for us. The future for us is that upper building. You know, we own that upper building and currently we rent it out to a couple different tenants. It's really two separate buildings. In total, it's, it's close to 10,000 square feet of space. Our vision is for the bottom part of that building to be kids space, a space where our kids can go and we can have a, 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 an excellent space where that they can hear the gospel, have things going on during the week. And we envision that upper space being a space for students and community events where we can reach our community. And those are big things for us. The great news is this renovation is done and it's great. The bad news is it didn't create any more space and we need more space, especially at our second hour for kids. So here's where I'm asking us to set sail. Here's where I'm asking us to cut some lifeboats and that's in making some decisions as a church. Are we ready to take the next steps of renovating and investing in that building? And it'll be a big project for us. It'll be a big project for us. We've established a, what we're calling a next generation dream team. Uh, some of you have been contacted about that. that. That team needs to start now and what their job is to begin thinking and praying about what that building might look like. What do we want to put in there? How do we want to design it? How do we want to make it so we reach kids and students in both of those buildings? That'll probably be a project we tackle where we do one, one part of that first. It's going to be a, a sacrifice for us as a church. It's going to be bigger than anything we've ever done financially as a church. But church, I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to set out, cut away the lifeboats, all the things that make us feel safe and comfortable. And man, let's just see what God would do. Let's see if God would show up in our finances. Let's see if God would show up in our service. Let's see if God would, would allow us and meet us to do this. And church, we need to pray. We need to pray. There's some current things that are going on in here. You notice there's some new acoustic panels. I won't tell you the whole story, but this was a gift from the Lord that we got these things. This will greatly change how it sounds in here. So we have this value of gathering. We want our worship to be excellent. These panels are gonna make this room sound so much better. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, maybe months, depending on uh, sh the shipping issues we're running into, where you have a brand new sound system that's going in. All these things have been paid for by your generosity so that, that we can make this room as best it can be. So here's my question for you and then we'll close. What are your next steps? Maybe God's calling you into your own life. What are some lifeboats in your life, some areas of comfort that you need to cut away and get out on deep waters where all you can do is lean hard on Jesus? Maybe God's prompting you to be more faithful in the way you give and in your generosity here. Maybe God's calling you to be more, 
more faithful in your attendance here. Maybe God's calling you to join our church and to be all in and to find a place to serve, to meet other people, to connect and do your part here as a church. I believe more than ever before that life's better in community. And church, there's no other community I want to set out on this journey with than you. I love Community Bible Greenwood. It's been some of the greatest years of my life, but I'm ready to do something great. I believe God's leading us to do something great. I believe God's leading us to be courageous and to cut away all the things that make us comfortable. And man, let's just set out, trust God and see what he can do because I believe in the very near future, we can have a facility that God can use to reach hundreds and hundreds of families and kids and students that will help us get the gospel to our community. So may God give us his mind, may he give us his heart for reaching the next generation of believers. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we love you and we are so deeply grateful for your goodness and grace in our lives. God, we're grateful for this story, all of the detail and the practical things that we can see that remind us that you're a God that can be trusted. And God, so often in our lives of faith, we we keep ourselves comfortable. We don't want to set out in deep waters. We want to make sure that we try to maintain in our own minds at least some aspect of control on the way things are going. But God, help us to cut away any of those lifeboats in our life. Anything that is a, is a crutch or something we lean on that keeps us in places of mediocrity. God, we want to live lives that trust you. God, we want to do things that feel risky to us, but we know that we're safe and secure in who you are. So God, as a church, would you lead us out into those deep waters where we can trust you? God, lead us to a place where every single week we come here, we're simply trusting that you're gonna show up, trusting that you're gonna change our lives, and trusting that you're gonna show us your mind and your heart to reach this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, there's more that we can do. I, b I believe you're leading us to greater places, to more things, and to more people, and to greater influence. And God, we want you to show us exactly what that is. So God, give us the courage to cut away the lifeboats in our lives as individuals and as a church. In Jesus' name, amen.